Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. Tonight on NJTV News, legal weed is up in smoke. Senate President Sweeney says he can't corral the votes to legalize marijuana in the Senate and that it should go to the voters in 2020. Governor Murphy responds. They're called the patriotic millionaires. Why they want the people who work under that gold dome to raise taxes on them. It's the annual Women's Health Symposium, what's being done at the state level and why outreach is a key message. Plus, the New Jersey Youth Symphony prepares to celebrate a milestone by making a joyful noise. Those stories and more next on NJTV News. Live from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us on air and online. A legal weed law is dead, but that doesn't mean it's dead and gone. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron has details. Senate President Sweeney said he's given up trying to get enough votes in the Senate to legalize marijuana. He said the legislature could go ahead with a medical marijuana expansion bill that is popular in Trenton. He said it's also a good idea to pass a bill that would expunge the criminal records of those with low-level marijuana convictions. Sweeney told Michael Hill that a referendum on the ballot in 2020 is his second choice. We were attempting to get marijuana passed through the legislative process, the legalization of marijuana, and we just don't have the votes to pass it right now. So. Uh, I made a decision as the president of the Senate that we're going to move to a ballot initiative for the 2020, president, 2020 general election. And uh, how difficult will it be to get it on the ballot at this point? It won't be difficult at all. In fact, it, that's probably the easiest thing. You know, then it's getting it passed, which obviously I'm not going to underestimate. But a lot of the people in the state of New Jersey truly support legalization of marijuana, and I would expect it to pass pretty easily. Murphy responded here in East Windsor, where he met with local officials to talk about his 2020 budget plan. He said he basically has a mixed reaction to Sweeney's morning announcement. The expungement piece of that is enormously important. And what we came close to achieving a couple of months ago had a historic, not just expungement, but vacating of sentences of folks in the system today. Uh, which is in, which, w which would have been historic. So I'm, I'm all in conceptually for that. I guess the devil's going to be in the details because you, uh, you know, the, the, the medical marijuana bill actually informs itself from the adult use bill, and that's going to have to, I think, be addressed. And as well as the expungement bill, not only informs itself from the adult use marijuana bill, um, but I'm not clear based on what was discussed this morning, and, and admittedly I've been running around and I haven't had a chance to clarify it, um, are we expunging something in the past that is still illegal today? And I would just remind everybody that 600 people this week will be arrested, plus or minus, depending on the time of the year, but plus or minus 600 people will be arrested for low end for marijuana offenses, 450-ish of them will be of color. So Murphy sounds like a reluctant participant in the effort to get a marijuana question on the 2020 ballot. Sweeney took a couple of swipes at the governor for their collective failure to get this through the legislature. Murphy said he rejected that, that it had been a team effort all the way. Assembly Speaker Craig Coughlin weighed in as well today, saying he supports the Sweeney plan. In East Windsor, I'm Michael Aaron. Back to you, Mary Alice. Thank you, Michael. The governor does still want to impose that tax on millionaires, despite a quarter billion dollar surge in state tax revenues. And some millionaires, business leaders and big investors back the idea. Michael Hill has the story. 
tax the rich. That includes himself, Morris Pearl, the board chairman of Patriotic Millionaires. He joined New Jersey Working Families, New Jersey Citizen Action, Make the Road New Jersey, and New Jersey Policy Perspective, demanding lawmakers leave the millionaires tax in Governor Murphy's budget for the next fiscal year. I asked the legislature, whose side are you on? Are you on the side of the very few and the very, very wealthy and the corrupt oligarchs who write and then break their own laws. We come from different walks of life, but we share a common vision. We demand fairness in our tax system. Inequality is rising in New Jersey and our tax system makes it worse. The wealthy in this state have benefited more than any other group from our growing economy and from the changes in the federal tax laws. And it's far past time for them to pay our fair share. The advocates say we may be doing well right now in tax collections, but New Jersey needs more money for schools, infrastructure, NJ Transit, environmental cleanup, and much more. A millionaire's tax is not just about the fiscal year 2020 budget. It is about getting the state off of one-shot gimmicks, unreliable sources of revenue that we have to come back and figure out how we're going to make this budget work every single year. The millionaire's tax is a fair tax. It's not only a tax that we need, but it's a tax that we can't afford not to, not to enact. The patriotic millionaires say the people who work under that gold dome need to show New Jerseyans a little courage. Multiple times, then-Republican Governor Christie vetoed the millionaire's tax that the still Democrat-controlled Senate and Assembly approved. I think it was easier to pass these things when they knew that Chris Christie would veto them. But now, yeah, they need some bravery. We are surely the most taxed state in the nation. The New Jersey Business and Industry Association says another tax is not the answer. What we need now is we need reform, Michael. We don't need more spending. Um, we need to step back and we need to fix the things that are structurally broken here in the state of New Jersey that are sucking up all the money that we are taking from New Jersey's residents and New Jersey's businesses. The NJBIA predicts lawmakers will remove the millionaire's tax from the budget. Among those leading the charge, the Senate president. Our tax policy is so bad in the state of New Jersey, the cost is so bad of doing business in New Jersey, people don't want to come here. Lawmakers and the governor have until June 30th to agree on spending for the next fiscal year. Michael Hill, NJTV News. To dive deeper into this story, head to NJSpotlight.com, where John Reitmeyer reports lawmakers are resisting a millionaire's tax even as tax revenues grow. Getting down to the business of putting the state's books in order. Here with that and all the day's business news is Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda? Mary Alice, for months, Senate President Steve Sweeney has been talking about his ideas to shore up New Jersey's finances. Now, talk will turn to action. Tomorrow, Senator Sweeney is set to introduce bills that he believes will help set the state on a better financial course. Those bills would be based on proposals put forth in Sweeney's Path to Progress report, which aims to put a lid on property tax hikes. It's expected that Sweeney will introduce a bill to move school employees into the state benefits plan. Another likely bill would change the retirement plan for some state and local government workers along with teachers. Newer employees not yet vested in the pension system would move to a retirement plan that combines features of both a pension and a 401k. Police, firefighters, and judges would be exempt. Sweeney has faced opposition to some of his ideas from labor unions and others, but he says the state would save millions. Governor Phil Murphy's plan to replace the EDA's current and highly scrutinized program of business tax incentives is getting the thumbs up from the new chairman of New Jersey's Economic Development Authority. EDA Chairman Kevin Quinn told NJ Biz he supports the new program of tax incentives proposed by the governor to replace the controversial Grow New Jersey tax credits that expire at the end of this fiscal year. Quinn stated he's partial to Murphy's idea of using tax credits to support growing an innovation economy, which would focus on smaller and medium-sized businesses. Murphy has proposed five separate new tax incentive programs capped at $400 million a year, but the legislature would have to agree on that before anything new is implemented. Quinn was appointed to the EDA just last month. The state today awarded $3 million in grants to eight businesses and agencies for apprenticeship programs. Collectively, those programs will train 350 apprentices 
in a wide range of occupations, everything from paramedics to computer system analysts. There are currently 750 apprenticeship programs in New Jersey training thousands of residents. The state attorney general has gone after a Rumson-based financial advisor for preying on unsophisticated investors, claiming he made bad investment decisions for them in order to line his own pockets. The state has revoked the registration of Gabriel Block, who was also fined $750,000. Block's victims include a quadriplegic, an elderly widow, and an unemployed and widowed mother of three. On Wall Street today, stocks ended higher. The Dow rose 115 points. And those are your top business stories. Support for the Medical Report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. When it comes to preventing medical mistakes and protecting patients, New Jersey hospitals have slipped from first in the nation to sixth. The LeapFrog Group says unavoidable medical errors, avoidable medical errors and hospital-borne infections continue to be one of the leading causes of death in the U.S. The latest LeapFrog Hospital safety rankings of 68 hospitals here gave 31 A's, 27 B's, 7 C's, and 3 D's, including Mountainside Medical Center in Montclair, East Orange General Hospital, and Newark's University Hospital, which improved on last year's F after a major management shakeup that involves bringing in Health Commissioner Sharif el Nahal to run things at the state's only public hospital and New Jersey's largest provider of care for uninsured people. New Jersey's newly enacted laws to reduce the number of deaths among new mothers was just the start. This National Women's Health Week, the state health department is taking the message directly to communities most in need of it. Leah Mishkin reports. Newark resident Yadira Varaona is at the fourth annual Women's Health Symposium because she's interested in hearing about prenatal care. She told us through a translator that she had a miscarriage in March. It was very difficult for her because it was her first pregnancy and she was very excited. And the fact that she lost the baby, um, it, it was very painful. This year's symposium theme is stolen moments, highlighting high infant mortality rates among women of color. Earlier this year, First Lady Tammy Murphy announced her new statewide campaign, Nurture New Jersey, to reduce maternal deaths. The Garden State ranks 45th in the country in maternal deaths, and nearly half are African-American mothers. For people who are minority and people of women of color, you find that they are living in certain conditions which truly makes it stressful on the body. You're living in a, in a situation where you're, uh, if you are working, you get less pay than other people. If you are living in a home, it's not as good as somebody else. And if you are living in a community, you have to go further to find food and to find vegetables. And so these are stressful indicators that does terrible things to the body. The CEO of Newark Community Health Center says you need to have a healthy body to deliver healthy babies. For the woman to still be strong, still be of good courage, and still continue to push hard, but at the same time, ensure that she's connecting with a provider, with an OBGYN, with a family physician, so that they can take care of their bodies. New Jersey Department of Health Commissioner Sharif El Nahal says the health care system has to go out into the community. We put in $4.7 million to fund community health workers, uh, the vast majority of whom are women of color themselves from these communities, to go into communities, work with federally qualified health centers, to refer them into prenatal care if they are pregnant, to refer them into family planning services if they're thinking about becoming pregnant. The event is hosted by Newark Community Health Center. It provides primary care service to Essex County residents regardless of a person's ability to pay. You have to give sisters modalities to deal with the stressors in their life. While we work on getting rid of them, we have to give them tools and the ability 
to deal with them. The commissioner says his department is also working to tackle disparities in women's health care by reducing implicit bias. An important example is a lot of people miss heart attacks in women because they assume that it's anxiety or a mental health issue when a lot of their symptoms often uh, manifest themselves as stress, uh, sweating, etc. Asking our hospital CEOs to make it a strategic priority to reduce implicit bias, that is what's finally going to start to close these glaring disparities we see in healthcare outcomes. And in turn, decrease the number of women and babies lost to health complications. In Newark, Leah Mishkin, NJTV News. With great fanfare, Newark has renamed a major thoroughfare in memory of a giant. Kenneth Gibson was elected the first black mayor of this or any major city in the Northeast in the wake of civil disturbances that left the town torn apart. By the time he left office, Mayor Gibson had stabilized the city's finances, improved the health of its citizens, and put the town back on track. Kenneth Gibson died in March. Now Newark's current mayor has renamed the more than three mile length of Broad Street in Gibson's honor. By changing the name from Broad Street to Kenneth Allen Gibson Boulevard means that we made a turn in history, that we've moved forward in history, that we moved past isolationism and segregation and hatred and oppression and moved to a place that Newark can be proud of we have the first African-American mayor that just didn't represent African-Americans, but represented the entire city of Newark and gave his life so that all Newarkers can benefit from the progress of this city that was founded in 1666, but came alive in 1970. Now to another celebration in Newark with a symphonic rendition of 900-year-old poems in Latin and High German. Now, Many people might find that daunting, but the children performing Carmina Burana have another word for it, epic. Raven Santana got a dress rehearsal. It's really impressive. You close your eyes, you would definitely not know that these were high school students. Viraj Lal is a choir master for the Carmina Burana Project. The one-hour piece will be performed at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center by members of the New Jersey Youth Symphony. The concert is in honor of the symphony's 40th anniversary. While we're celebrating, you know, an anniversary, it's also making sure that we showcase that New Jersey music education is alive and well, and, and this is proof of it. Included in the orchestra is a very important woman, Helen Chapiao. She has the responsibility of conducting both instrumentalists and vocalists in what she says will be an epic event. I thought about celebrating just with New Jersey Youth Symphony families, which we have 500 students involved in 14 different ensembles. However, I thought it would be more meaningful to collaborate with wider community. So there are a Newark Boys Chorus. They will serve as the children's chorus that Carmina Barana uh, score requires. And also we have J.P. Stevens, Ridge High School, Somerville, and New Providence High School choruses all joining. So we have over you know, close to 300 uh, chorus members up on the stage with 105 piece orchestra, all made up of high school students. Students spent months practicing the choral piece that is sung in both Latin and in German. It's special pronunciation, it's, it's a special way to sing it, it's a lot of things we had to teach. Besides assisting students with the languages, Jack Bender also composed music to accompany three poems of Langston Hughes, which will premiere before the performance of Cormina Burana. I think the message in the three poems I chose are really nice for the kids um, about uh, catching dreams and, and holding on to dreams. In addition to performing with high school students from 13 different counties, students will also have the opportunity to perform alongside three professional opera singers. I was like, can I watch them? But then you're in the orchestra and it's like, you kind of have to be the backup for someone who's a professional. It's like, they get almost like they, they trust you that much to be that person and also like you get to be in, in them and making music with someone who's that skilled and at such a high of a level. This is going to be 
um, an amazing opportunity, once in a lifetime opportunity, um, and I'm really glad that I get to do it alongside my friends and alongside other students who are interested and just so proud of uh, the choral arts, of the instrumental arts. It's, you're, not, you're not used to playing with these instrumentalists like every single day, as I am with one of my other trumpet players who plays here. Um, and you have to, you've got to mesh with their sound. You've got to be able to be comfortable around them. The 40th anniversary concert will be performed this Sunday, and all proceeds from the tickets will go to helping fund the New Jersey Youth Symphony. In Livingston, Raven Santana, NJTV News. Tomorrow on NJ Spotlight, Tom Johnson will have the story about the $300 million in subsidies PSEG customers would have to pay for nuclear plants. Tom, what are you learning? Well, the New Jersey Division of Rate Council is challenging uh, the award of those subsidies uh, in the New Jersey Appellate Division. She says the subsidies are unjustified and unreasonable. They're not supported by the record in the case. And she's hoping to have them overturned in a future legal proceeding. Okay, Tom, sounds interesting. I look forward to reading it. And you can sign up for their daily newsletter. Go to njspotlight.com and click on NJ Spotlight Newsletters. leave you tonight at a beachside sanctuary being salvaged not by building up barricades of sand, but by stuffing barricades with recycled Christmas trees. Lauren Wonka watched how it works. Despite the warm temperatures, it feels a bit like a December day in one Ocean County community. It's still Christmas in May in Point Pleasant Borough. That's because a boat full of Christmas trees is being glided through the water at Slavedale Sanctuary. So the erosion has been terrible. We have condos here who are threatened. So the rebuilding of, of this sanctuary is very important, not only for homes, but for the environmental aspect of all of our birds and sea animal friends. What we're also seeing here too is that there's some creep of salt water coming up underneath the marsh and further back and starting to burn some of the trees and things that are in the forest. So what we want to do is bring this marsh back, extend it back to its historical, as best as we can, historical footprint, uh, doing some natural uh, solutions. The American Littoral Society is collaborating with the local government and various other organizations to complete the restoration project. An engineering company created the design, a design the nonprofit hasn't used in any other part of the state. The team is constructing a branch box breakwater in the marsh. So that's one of the technologies that we kind of borrowed and modified from New Orleans. Um, basically what it is, it's a, it's a line of cribbing. Uh, cribbing being wood and within that cribbing we put the Christmas trees in and kind of create a natural wall that still can let some water circulate but it stops the wave action so it stops that wave from coming into the marsh and taking more of that marsh out. In an effort to create other defenses the team is also building Christmas tree veins. What they are basically is trees set in a row offshore that kind of run perpendicular to shore that then catch that sediment raise the elevation of the marsh, and then the plants reestablish. That's the concept. Staff and volunteers secure the trees with stakes and twine. They're also placing hundreds of recycled oyster shells donated by Monmouth County restaurants around the trees for added weight and a new habitat for animals. The American Literal Society received about 800 trees from New Jersey residents. They launched their Christmas tree campaign right after the holidays. They asked folks to drop off their trees at a local church. The Point Pleasant Borough DPW also picked up the trees curbside, and eventually they brought everything to this location. But what a great resource to kind of put back into the system and use it twice. So it's good for gifts and it's good for, for marsh. It's our job to preserve the future of our wetlands for our children and grandchildren. The American Literal Society will continue to monitor the project. They hope to add new Christmas trees each year. In Point Pleasant, Barrow, I'm Lauren Wonko and JTV News. 
And now some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. Nine out of ten states legalize marijuana through a ballot question. New Jersey's now looking to do the same. There are 293,992 millionaire households in New Jersey, according to Phoenix Marketing International. Ken Gibson served as mayor of Newark from 1970 to 1986. And the New Jersey Youth Symphony was founded in 1979. If there's someone who you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag no Jersey. Tomorrow on NJTV News, Camden's coming back. Are those controversial EDA tax breaks actually paying off? To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thanks for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. W.J. Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. PSE&G is building New Jersey's clean energy future. We're working to protect our network against extreme weather expanding and upgrading transmission lines, and modernizing our natural gas system by installing new, more durable underground pipes. At PSE&G, our goal is to make sure you have the safe, reliable energy you need to power your life now and into the future. For over 85 years, in every county across the state, we've protected the health of New Jersey, covering families, and businesses through life's big moments and the small ones. Because we don't just work here, we live here too. Over 5,000 local employees, all with the same purpose, taking care of you.